and now uh, I'm happy to say that we are moving to uh, the next uh, part of our conference, unfortunately the last but not the least, uh, which will be a, a presentation uh, from which I call lecture from practitioner uh, because we have an amazing speaker with us. Uh, uh, this is Marina Starodubska. Um, you can already see her. Uh, Marina has very uh, very big experience of working with different uh, teams uh, uh, on uh, working with them on their organizational culture, on uh, building uh, strong uh, teams, on developing leadership in, uh, inside the teams. Uh, and she is a managing uh, partner of Telford Consulting Company. Uh, and today uh, she will present us um, uh, several um, uh, points about what kind of leadership a resilient organization needs. And this is something that we finished with uh, in the previous panel discussion. So I really hope that this session will be uh, interesting and useful and very practical for all of you. And you will be able to have uh, some meaningful insights uh, and so you will be able to take them with you uh, to your daily work, to your daily job. So, Marina, uh, the floor is yours. And while you start, I'm sharing your presentation. All right. Uh, can you hear me well? Is everything okay with the sound? Yes, it's great. Okay. Uh, all right. While we're waiting for the slides to come up, I just wanted to thank the previous uh panel discussion of participants for your insights because what you said about the need for us to keep our people's spirits and motivation up is very important because the topic of organizational resilience is a very hot issue right now not only because of the pandemic but because of the ways the business overall and cultural sphere in particular has been has become more interconnected and uh, you know there's more more things happening more things to consider there are virtual teams where we have people from many countries interacting so today we will talk about what's on the screen the culture and the behaviors we need to build a resilient uh, organization uh, and uh, Irina is very kindly helping me to make sure the slides are going and you see them. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, as you see on your right, uh, there is actually an organization in the world that specializes in studying and practicing consulting in the, air, in the area of organizational resilience. It's called Organization, Organizational Resilience Network. And they have this very useful, in my opinion, um, framework of the three parts. You see the blue, the green, and, and the red. What components organizational resilience consists of? And today we will cover the first one, which is green, culture, and behaviors. On July 8th, we will cover the blue one which is leadership and strategy and also for our uh, self-study so to speak we have the red portion which is risk management which is a very important area as well so uh, what's org resilience anyway it's an ability to absorb and adapt to a changing environment and as you see not only adapt but also absorb so when you absorb an impact when you absorb the change you as an organization you change as well and that means we have to maintain our productivity to serve our constituents to achieve our goals on the one hand and on the other hand we have to help our people to go through that change and as you see on the slide there are 16 behaviors because in that network you see that white circle in the middle there's really tiny text so not to put stress on your eyes i just put them on the slide you see the 16 behaviors of the resilient organization and if you just skim through them you can see that most of them i'd say 14 out of 16 are people focused and team oriented so to be resilient, the key thing, 
at least one third of this resilience is to be able to productively work with people and maintain coherency in the teams. So let's begin our green part of, the, of this uh, framework and let's look at the five checkpoints of a resilient culture. Let's go to the next slide. Um, we will be talking here about organizational culture. So throughout my presentation, when I say culture, I mean org culture, not the sphere that you all represent. Uh, what, what is culture anyway yeah? in, the, in an organization? It's the beliefs, the values, and the behaviors we all share. All share is the key word. And by all, the science means 75%. For an organization to really have a dominant culture, 75% of our people have to share this culture. Unless that is the case, we can't really say we have a dominant culture. Science also says it's okay especially for a big organization, to have a mix of cultures, one or two. However, science also says that if you have a mix of cultures inside your organization, the two of them, two of the mix, there can be three and more, two of this mix have to be shared by 90% of your people. What does this tell us? This tells us that to be coherent, as a living organism, which we believe an organization is, we need to know what kind of culture we have, what checkpoints this culture has, where do we look to see are we doing okay? This is what this slide is for. How do we feel culture in an organization anyway? I'm an employee, I'm a manager. How do I feel culture? This is how, through performance climate. Performance climate, if you will, it's the employee's user experience with your organization or with my organization, or with any organization. So whatever user experience our people have at work with us through the five checkpoints defines how they act, how they feel, how they perform, and in the end, how resilient we are. And if you note, there are two little heads in there, you see, communications. Communications to a performance climate is like an uh, oil to a car's engine. Without the oil, surely a car can work, but not for long and not too well. So communications basically oils the organization's mechanism as it operates. And if there is a breakdown in that mechanism, you see these five checkpoints, five little pictograms in there? They all be, get into disarray. They stop working cohesively. So let's look at them. And the next slides, I will go over each checkpoint and we will dive in there and see some practical stuff what we can do to help our teams be more resilient we start from the top with the cup and the donut connection first checkpoint is does your team connect to your organization do your people believe that this is my organization it's just not the place where i just you know Come make some money, have a good time, but really, it's not my organization. Do people identify? Because if they do, they will be more prone to protect the organization's interests, to look out for it, and to seek solutions. Next one, with the little gears, processes. Pro processes are highly important. Those of you who operate in Ukraine and interact with the government sector, dread this word because processes can be very mundane and very difficult. However, as you will see next in the presentation, processes mean more than words that we say to our people. 
Because if our team's user experience with our organizational processes is horrific, it's going to impact their performance and, as a result, our resilience. Now we see that little, like little, little scheme, the hierarchy roles. What are roles? Well, I'm a managing partner at my company. Depending on the culture, to my people, I can be a mentor. I can be a controller. I can be an, ins an inspirational visionary. Or I can be a mom and a psychiatrist slash psychologist. That all depends. So what roles are our people performing in our organization? Uh, what about the responsibility? With whom does it lie? If I make a mistake, do we look for solutions? Do we look for the guilty people? What's going on? Roles. Next one, goals. In a pandemic, it's very interesting checkpoint because as you just discussed in the previous panel, you can't plan for long anymore. God forbid we have another lockdown with our vaccination you know, pace in Ukraine. It's, it's, it's a possibility. But goals, do people understand like where we are going as a big ship? Because if they do not, or if they have different understanding of that in different departments, that alone can impact which tasks are considered priority and which are not. And the last one, adaptability, change. The world surely has had enough of that during the last two years, but uh, change in itself is a very powerful stressor. And there are cultures, national cultures, who react to change differently. For instance, uh, Ukrainians, which I am, have among the highest in the world rates of uncertainty avoidance. And that's ironic because our country has been living in a constant non-stop change since the inception of, of the beginnings of Ukraine long time ago. But we are traumatized by this change. We detest it. It depresses us. So change is a stressor. So as leaders, we need to think, how can we turn change for our people from, oh my God, again, to something, okay, it's a task, it's a challenge, it's an assignment, but I can deal with it. So let's dive into connections. Next slide and see what we have there. Uh, just tiny thing, I have three slides like that for you. Numbers, because you know, when we're talking about any area where you have a lot of logistics and events and, and networking involved, we always think, okay, our team has got my back. They understand that we need to you know, get down and get through this. And they know we respect them. They know we value them. But let's focus on the task now. If you do that enough times, people may forget that we value them and we respect them. And they may begin to perceive our culture as destructive culture or toxic. And numbers in that case are very bad. Uh, Ernst & Young top, top Employee Survey for 2020 shows that uh, in 69% of cases, toxic or destructive culture, and in 58% of cases, not getting along with your direct supervisor, are top two decisions to leave the company for all experienced employees, regardless of the compensation level. So you would think oh, people leave the organization where they don't get paid enough. No, they leave the organization where they feel they are in a destructive environment, regardless of how much they receive. So let's look on the next slide at the connection part. Uh, 
when we're talking about connection from a practical standpoint, the thing to look out for is engagement. How engaged are our teams in work? What's engagement? Right of your slide, the little column. Engagement is a deliberate and active participation of our employees in doing the work with three conditions. First, voluntary intellectual effort. That means when I'm doing the job, I'm actually thinking, how can I do it better? Am I doing it efficiently? Are there things I can change? Are there interactions with other people I can modify? Second, positive emotions. Oh, surely we do not all like our jobs every day. I do not like my job every day, that's for sure. However, overall, overall, I like what I do. I accept the stresses that come with it. I accept the cost of a job like consultancy, but I love it at the end. Do our people feel that way about their job? Because we spend two thirds of our adult life time-wise at work. And if our people are constantly distressed during such a long time, we will have problems with performance because our people will have problems with health with physical health. Third, meaningful social interactions. And that is something that the pandemic has hit really hard because it's difficult to have those interactions online. Being very highly introverted, me, I've noticed that by the almost second year of lockdowns, I actually miss live people. I can only understand my team which consists of mostly extroverted people how they feel so engagement in a nutshell is when your team knows what to do wants and tries to improve it has good emotions from it and has meaningful social connections like to perform in this team so from that we have three levels of engagement to to think about and to support. Number one, intellectual engagement. From what I heard and from the work of the people I know, I'm so glad to uh, see uh, Olesa here and our family is very big fans of Book Arsenal. We've been going every year, so I'm, I'm very honored to be on the same stage with you. Um, intellectual, but in from the caliber of speakers here, I understand that your people are absolutely intellectually engaged because all professionals are. But are they engaged in your organization or are they engaged in their process and in their task? And they don't care at which organization to do it. And that is a very interesting issue because with the pandemic, with the weakening physical connections you sit online at home at your device does it matter to which organization i belong and that's a question mark because i i think we're just looking for that answer emotional engagement that's another thing do i feel good do i feel proud do i feel anything positive from the job and I, I very much relate to what thomas was saying and and and, and alexandra earlier how how depressed the teams were because of because of what was happening and because how the cultural sphere was treated and uh if our people's emotional engagement goes down the creativity goes down the critical thinking goes down, the feedback quality goes down, and that means as leaders, what happens? We find out about problems later, we get worse solutions from our teams, we get less, fewer solutions from our teams. So emotional engagement is important. Social engagement, that is, a difficult one because what kind of <clears throat> what kind of social engagement can you have at your computer at home 
online. And here, as leaders, we would need to step up because our people by themselves cannot do it. It is a leader's job to provide means for our teams to engage emotionally and find a way to do it. <clears throat> We've had clients with experiences from company-wide cooking classes to discussing books to, you won't believe, bird watching out the windows. Uh, doesn't matter what it is. What matters is, is we maintain the social part. Otherwise, our teams will disintegrate because social is about interacting with people. Let's look at the next slide, what we have there. Uh, the next part is, is the example. Bear with me, don't get scared. I know it's late in the event and, and, and you'll see graphs before you. I'll, I'll get you through them, it's very easy. It's one of uh, our clients, anonymized of course, uh, research results where they tried to do a diagnostics of their team's organizational principles. Like what do people believe it? What moves people? On your slide, to your left, there is a diagram, uh, the result of the survey from employees under 30 years old, those whom we call the Generation Z or Generation Z. Yes, the young, young employees, the youngest employable generation. To your right, you have the diagram for employees over 40 years old, the X generation. And you see there are two lines on each graph. Now the green line is how things are, what's happening now. The red line is how things should be, how people feel the principles should look like. Now let's start from the left. Do you see the highest, like the highest peaks, two highest peaks, uh, what's now is red. And red means that many, many employees under uh, 30 believe that today the key principle that is moving the organization is we can make the impossible happen and we unequivocally follow our leader. What the leader says I do, where the leader says I go. This is what young people believe is happening. The other quite pronounced peak, how things are, is brown. And brownness were focused on KPIs and best results, but it's a little low. Now, it doesn't take a scientist to, to see that to the right, the picture is absolutely different. The peaks are in the different part of the diagram and they are much taller. While younger generation of this company believes that it's the big leader who should tell them where to go, the older employees believe that we have the KPIs, let's perform and let's gradually move, as you can see, the green principle, we're a team of talents. You see a problem here, right? It's the same organization. These people are mixed in, in the same departments. They sit in the same virtual office before they sat in the same physical offices. And what's happening is, they used to share the same physical space, but look, they couldn't be more different mentally. Why is that? There can be at least four obvious reasons and many more quite less obvious. Number one possible reason, in this organization, younger employees do not get much uh, chance to suggest solutions and actually speak up. And those who are over 40 years old are their bosses who think that everything's fine. That's the obvious reason. A less obvious reason can be that this organization has very different, differently operating units. It has manufacturing, it has sales, it has uh, 
trade, it has IT, and these are like little kingdoms. And in many of them, the culture is different. So why am I showing this to you? Connection is a powerful thing. People can come to the same place, physical or virtual. They can seemingly hear in the meetings the same words said by the supervisor. But from all of those checkpoints, from the user experience of the organization, their view is completely different. So as a leader in every team, it's our job to understand, are we on the same page? Do we understand each other? Are we seeing, are we all seeing this crisis as a crisis and this as a challenge? Or, are we, or do we not? Let's look at the next slide and see how we can move from that. Processes. Processes are very much underrated when it comes to managing culture. For some reason, uh, oftentimes, heads of organizations believe that process is something the operations must be taking care of. What does it have to do with managing people? Everything. Because processes matter more than words. If we declare that we are a nimble, agile, forward-thinking, creative organization, and people like it, but then they try to take a vacation at our organization, and they try to fill out the paperwork, and then it turns out we're not nimble, we're not agile, we're not so productive and easygoing and, and, and then people have this cognitive dissonance. How can we say one thing and be the other? So it's very important to look at our processes and see do our processes in which our people are involved inside from entering the office to uh, filling out paperwork for expense reports, to suggesting improvements, to whatever else. Are the processes supporting our values or are they in direct opposition with them? Lack of communications is in the top three reasons for failed change, especially if the transformation is quite radical and your organization has more than 10 people. Because in such a case, every unit <clears throat> is transforming at a different pace in, 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 through a different mechanism and, and, and sees a different ending point of this transformation. To give you a number, you've noticed I like numbers. Uh, leaders in today's, the fashionable uh, acronym, the VUCA, yes, the VUCA world, in the VUCA world, you, the leader has to dedicate 30 to 50% of their time minimum to communication with employees. And that, that is beyond task setting. Otherwise, the organization just, I won't say it disintegrates, but have you heard the, a, a toy car? Of your of your or your relative's child squeaking when they roll it on the floor. That's how the organization works with no communication. And the last but not least, you see the world underlined. Perceived fairness is key to he, to high employee motivation. Let's talk about this a little bit. Science says that perceived fairness is the most powerful intrinsic internal motivator of people employed at an organization. So let's say because of the pandemic, uh, you revised your system of KPIs. If your teams believe that the new system is unfair, doesn't matter what genius designed and how effective it really is. Perceived fairness is like color of shades on your sunglasses. If it's dark, it's dark. If it's pink, the world is rosy. So fairness works like that. And there are three types of fairness. 
there is procedural, procedural fairness. Are our processes fair? What do we mean by fair? If I, a receptionist, and I, a sales manager, or I, deputy CEO, decide to suggest an idea in my organization, are we going to be given a chance, equal chance, to be heard? If yes, everything is okay with your procedural justice. Fairness, interactional, communications. What does that mean? Can I, as an employee, voice my concerns openly without reprimand and directly to my supervisor? If I cannot, we have problems with interactional justice and fairness. Because if I cannot voice my concerns, what do, what do I mean by cannot? Yeah, no one can close my mouth physically, right? No one can, but I can be bullied into silence. I can be treated unfairly. I can be shown to understand that this is not the kind of communication we tolerate here. So interactional justice, distributive fairness, who is responsible? When we have a screw up, a big time failure during a project, who takes the blame? Do we even talk in, in, in terms of blame? Do we seek solutions or are we pointing fingers? All of these things matter when we talk about culture. Now, an example to your right. One of our clients, did a reputation audit among employees to see anonymous to see how people perceive the company and how they relate to the current culture and you can see the three colors on the rings to your left yellow it says integrated employees 39 percent of the employees are integrated it means they are they they kind of have the they share the culture. These are the ones that actually support the company values. So we're happy with those. Now look at the blue, 28% toxic and isolated employees. They barely perform not to be fired. They just sit there. And look how many of them, 28%. Do you see the green part? Yes, 33% fighters for change. Nothing good in that name. Uh, unhappy employees actively involved in disputes with management. Question, what is the biggest problem with this organization's culture? Since I can't take questions in real time, I'll answer it for you. The biggest problem in this culture is that only 39% of people actually share it. What that means is you walk down the corridor in that organization and your chance of seeing proper expected behavior is meager. 28 plus 33% of people are on the verge of hating their employee or completely disengaging. And Part of the reasons is horrifically bureaucratic processes in that place. Now, let's see what else we have. Let's go to the next slide. Roles. Don't be scared of all the text. I prepared slides so that you can take them with you. There are four things to see to your left. A little checklist. How do we make sure? that our leaders in our organization perform well in their roles. Four checkup points. Delayer. Look at the levels of hierarchy in your organization. Do we need them all? And by hierarchy, I do not necessarily mean vertical, but like the levels of decision making. Do we need them all? Which ones are we do not need? Can we have more kind of collective management bodies 
instead of the hierarchical ones? Do all people in our company understand what the process looks like to which they contribute? To organize a festival, you need hundreds and thousands of processes very well understood by everybody. Are they understood? Because if the processes are not well understood, the prioritization of tasks will suffer. An employee may honestly believe that the urgent, urgent task you're giving them is not that urgent. Because to them, the process looks differently. Empower, what that means. How many times a year do your managers kind of evaluate and encourage and reward your people? And I do not necessarily mean bonuses. Just do something for them as teams. Before the pandemic, it was going out together. In the pandemic, uh, some people send care packages to their employees' homes. But how many times a year do your managers have the budget and the autonomy and authority to tell their teams, good job, with something more than words? It doesn't have to be expensive, but it matters because we lost the physical connection, we all sit at homes. And what used to be pat on the back in the office, just casually, now is not available. Accelerate, what that means is, if I were asked the question, in which layer of management is it best to invest your scarce budget, I'd say mid-level. For one reason, under your mid-level management, there is the mathematical majority of your employees. If these people are not possessing the leadership skills, the soft skills, the communication skills, they are managing everybody else. They can be very good specialists in their area. But if they are not taught argumentation, active listening, feedback, there are five formats of feedback, um, basic team speaking skills, we are going to have problems down the line, especially in a virtual format, because virtual speaking, like we all are doing right now, it's a skill. Doing that productively with the team, it's a skill you should be. People should be taught that. And lastly, leverage. Do we involve our people in managing the organization? What I mean by that is when the first pandemic hit, uh, my partner and I, we talked to our people to understand what solutions we can offer clients who were hesitating to switch to online quickly. So they wanted live consulting and trainings, which were not only not available, they were forbidden. So these are just kind of thought processes to go through to ensure that our team roles are properly performed. Let's go next to the next one. Yeah, motivation, just a little bit of science. The level of motivation of our middle management defines the level of motivation of everybody else. So if you have a, a unit, a department, a project where the head of that unit is toxic, unhappy, dissatisfied, disengaged, rest assured, everybody else has the same problem. And that team will or already has been having performance problems. Let's go to the next checkpoint. Goals. Uh, goals are my favorite part because it's not only about, okay, people, we have this five KPIs to achieve. It's also about leadership and followership. Can you believe it's a word? I checked. It's a word, followership. Um, a lot of new leadership models are actually centered not around the leader, 
but around the follower. If you don't have followers, what kind of leader are you? So in a healthy organization, as you can see, the six red check marks, just things to consider. Leaders. In a healthy organization, leaders take responsibility. They explain strategy. They serve as role models. So um, in a pandemic, it's us. Because as I understand, all of you are leaders in your organizations, or at least in some of their units. It's us to whom our people look up. And it's us who has to show how it's done and help when they need help. Yeah, in addition to everything else we have to do. Feedback, frequently. And by frequently, um, our research, our experience, and science shows that uh, the world is moving away from twice a year, twice annual feedback, twice a year. I mean, can you imagine someone younger than 30 years old waiting six months to give, until you give them feedback? They're going to forget what the feedback was about. So weekly or monthly, uh, uh, focused on how job is done, how, how, how the employees are doing. And online, it's as important as ever because we don't have the physical environment to remind people that they are actually at work. They have all the pressures, and to some of them, work and home are so intermixed, they are distanced from company's culture. Encourage behaviors, variety of opinions, and healthy criticism, and taking responsibility for your words. An unhealthy organization is the one where the boss is always right, where if you're new, you're nobody. Wait until you work here for some time. Uh, if you cannot offer an idea without selling it to the organization's holy cow first. So these are signs that something is wrong. In a healthy organization, what's not tolerated are gossip, intrigues, withholding information, criticizing for the sake of criticizing. Best way to gain trust, do your job, fulfill obligations, be respectful, support your team and your superior. And the, the, tell, the big telltale sign, when I disagree in a healthy organization, I voice my concerns and I support them with data, and I accept the finalized opinion that everyone discussed, even if I don't agree with it. Now, let's very quickly look at an unhealthy organization. It's the opposite of that. So what does unhealthy look like? It's the next slide. Unhealthy. Unhealthy. It's all the vice versa. Leaders don't take responsibility. Leaders avoid difficult conversations. Leaders condone double standards. A telltale sign of a non-resilient, shaky, unhealthy culture is when a superior is allowed to get away with more than a subordinate. I'll say it in Ukrainian just for clarity. It's the same that I just said in English, to get away with. That is a sign that there's something really wrong with culture. Feedback. An unhealthy organization is the one where the boss tells you, quick, 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 let's get going, 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 stop talking. Wait, are we even going in, in, in the needed direction? What if the circumstances changed and we need to discuss and regroup? Uh, encourage behaviors. In an unhealthy organization, loyalty comes before professionalism. Loyalty to the boss. Doesn't matter the level of the boss. Uh, and another very unhealthy uh, manifestation of culture is you do what you told always no questions asked surely there are times when this is necessary like an acute crisis but no one lives in an acute crisis every day not tolerated disagreement with leader rocking the boat um talking 
as a position to doing. In an all healthy organization, best way to gain trust is do what superior says, like whom superior likes, do whatever superior throws at you, and offer as little your input as you can. In an unhealthy organization, when I disagree, I do not speak about my disagreement unless directly asked. So on the slide, it seems odd. I mean, how can you have all of that? in an organization, but you never really have all of that at once. You have little sprouts of toxicity here and there. And you think that, oh, it's just one as isolated incident. But is it? Is it? Are there enclaves? Are there like sectors, segments of your organization where these are not isolated incidents? They're actually a new reality. But because of online, you don't know about it. Let's check out the next one. Oh, uh, toxicity. Toxic COVID. And for that number here, a team of 20 people needs to have just one toxic member. So this is no joke. It's a very important problem. And with online, where we can't really see and can't physically go around and support our people, that matters a lot. Let's check out the two last slides, actually one. Adaptability. Practical steps to boosting adaptability. No one can work 24-7. I know you know that. But sometimes we expect from our people to go on without sleep and rest and vacation for a long time. And we know that that's what it takes. The times are difficult. I mean, COVID and everything. But people are biological beings. And from our experience, I can say that, and the science confirms that, after three weeks of no weekends and no sleep, or very little sleep, the decision-making quality of our people drops abruptly. You will be appalled when you get enough sleep at the decisions you made in that state. So we need to accept as leaders that people are biological beings and forcing the team to take that day and sleep. It's for our organization's sake because the mistakes a team of 20 who hasn't slept for two months can make, the cost of those mistakes can be very high. Replenishment and reflection means work. People need to process information and, so, and frequently talk it out before they can act on it. In, in, in offline life, this was happening naturally because people were going to each other. Online, we always, not always, but often forget that, you know, you give out the tasks, but then people need to, to go over them and talk them out. And, and it's the leader's job to provide that space and instill that habit because it's not going to happen naturally online. The mechanism of, of this interaction online is very forced and unnatural so as leaders we need to understand that it's our job to ensure people reflect talk talk over the tasks give and get feedback voice concerns and we monitor that they actually rest however they can Communication and values-based behaviors should be part of your KPIs. You represent very reputable organizations. I'm sure you have competencies according to which you evaluate your employees. The question is, are those competencies purely task-based or profession-based? Or are there values-based behaviors in there? Because if our competencies do not have the values-based behaviors in them, toxic high performance can dominate in our organizations without necessarily occupying leadership positions. 
and our culture will be very far from resilient because you remember the numbers about toxicity. So it's very important that we hire, promote, and reward our people, not only uh, for how well they perform the actual tasks, but for how they behave in the process and how they uphold the values because that is the glue that holds your team together, especially online. <clears throat> and the last one, and that is the last word of me from this presentation, crisis war gaming and scenario planning. Uh, as reputable and <clears throat> organizations as all yours are, with the longevity that you have, I'm sure you can wake up at night and say from the top of your head, top 10 crises you know will happen this year. Write them down, brainstorm with your teams, evaluate their level of probability and impact, jot down strategies, you will save 50% of your time and a lot of budget when the crisis actually happens. Whew. I try to keep it uh, within our time frame. So thank you very much for listening and um, I'd be happy to discuss and, and take questions. Uh, Irina, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I stopped sharing my screen now, so we can go to the questions area. Uh, and before I check if you have questions from uh, the audience, I see that we have, uh, yes, we do, and we have command, uh, brilliant presentation and fantastic speech. Thank you. I totally agree. Uh, amazing presentation. Thank you for sharing. A few questions from my side and uh, then what, uh, questions from the audience. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, social and emotional engagement as two of the three important factors to ensure healthy culture inside the team. Uh, maybe you have some practical recommendations how specifically can we ensure the social and emotional engagement online uh, mm -hmm. with working with remote teams. Any tips and tricks, any tools or specific approaches that we can implement as managers and colleagues? Emotional engagement is in the things that many leaders often overlook. Uh, look, every time you have a meeting, let's say, or your weekly planning meeting, do you go right into planning or do you give people deliberately a, a chance to share what happened the previous week, uh, what pains will be during this week, uh, what did you do on weekends. Uh, it seems irrelevant to work on the surface, but it's critical when your only point of interaction with the company is Zoom. So for every one and a half hours of job talk, you need 15 to 20 minutes of live talk, be it at the beginning, be it in the middle, be it at the end. Uh, if you have uh, a like long periods of time during which you just throw tasks at people, make sure that you do not go longer than three days without some kind of general check-in at convenient times, of course, you need to manage the team schedule, but um, instill in your team the habit that people, online is online, I mean, we have only one life, why should we postpone it? But Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 1600, we have all hands on deck meeting to level the field, where everyone is, what's happening, introverts, may say again another meeting but even introverts are closed at home and that 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 makes a lot of difference the trick is for the leader to like it or act like they mean it because the leader looks like they don't want to be here <laughs> even extroverts will be disappointed sure. so, 
uh, yeah, for social engagement, social is a bit trickier because social is about giving your units because all of you represent quite big organizations. I mean, Telford is 10 people, uh, UI is 40, uh, others are even bigger. So units, every unit needs to have established, I call it little rituals. Doesn't matter what it is. Uh, some clients we have, you won't believe, watch movies. Some uh, play dates with kids. Some uh, discuss white papers. They read them, they discuss. Doesn't matter, but uh, just hang out to see. Okay. But online. And again, the reason a leader in the unit needs to be uh, a promoter of this is because it's unnatural. It's, it feels very unnatural at first. It's going to come later, and there's a scientific explanation for that. Because online, there is no connection. We fake it. It doesn't exist. And the leader needs to fake it the most <laughs> because other people depend on us. To, to, to give them support. So that's the, the, the basic things that don't require any funding. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting that you mentioned Monday, Wednesday, and Friday as an example, because this is exactly what we have in the Ukrainian Institute since the start of the lockdown, at least with our program team, because uh, we have uh, we used to have uh, daily online catch-ups, informal catch-ups, uh, just to talk about anything, but not about work. And then we switched to three uh, days per week. So it's very funny to hear that exact uh, specific day, uh, days of the weekend. And uh, you mentioned that uh, leaders should do that, but what about leadership, informal leadership? Uh, what uh, uh, can be the role and what should be the role of just teammates, team members? Uh, how can then, uh, how can they show the leadership, the appropriate leadership to create this additional engagement between each other? Should it be only uh, the job of the formal leader, the manager, the head of institution, mm -hmm. or the head of, of the team. You know, when I say leader, I, uh, I myself and in our company, we very much adhere to the uh, concept of service or humble leadership. I'm not the most uh, vocally vocal person at our company, and I'm the youngest in age. And uh, I believe a good leader has to give a push, a little stimulus, stimulus. Then uh, in our company, what we did, uh, I talked first separately to everybody, asked, so what's happening? How are you hanging? What pisses you off? And what pisses me off too? So kind of got this little one-on-one -on -one so that person understands that I, I share, I feel what's happening. Then I discussed the possibilities, what they would feel comfortable with. I understood the no-nos, where we're not going, what are the triggers, what's not happening. And then we had a general kind of discussion. So people, we need to have these kind of meetings just to make sure we're a team, to make sure everyone's okay. So let's vote and see what it is. Some people said, we're going to take time uh, to make suggestions. I said, good. So they went, they, they, they brainstormed something, they came back. And we had a, and still have, we have a recipe sharing group. I decompress when I bake. Uh, so it found, it, it, it happened, it turns out that a lot of our people decompress when they cook as well. So now we have uh, a separate chat where we just do that. And, and people do that without me already. They, they have their own thing. I, I, I drop in, of course, but I can see that they are in a good place and, you know, the, the the less of the boss and such interaction the better so kind of like that uh cool very interesting and uh i see a question in uh, our chat i'm not sure if i understood it 100 percent correctly so maybe i'll i will change it a bit uh but it's about the behaviors uh, i suppose some specific specific types of behaviors that you uh, mentioned uh, during your presentation and about uh if you can describe these behaviors uh, a, a bit more. So let me specify it a bit from my side. 
Uh, we were talking about toxic and healthy culture and toxic and healthy behaviors. Uh, can you please uh, advise how I, as a team member, can uh, notice that some behavior is toxic and what mm -hmm. should I do in this situation? Mm -hmm. How should I check my doubts? This is toxic mm -hmm. or not? And what should I do if I see and I assume that this is toxic? Okay. There are actually, uh, there is much simpler way to well, diagnose is a big word, but kind of feel that something is odd. Three, three behaviors that uh, signal that something is wrong. Distrust. Distrust in the team. Uh, there is us and there's them. We are technically one department, but there's us and there's them. There's apples and there's oranges. Uh, so you you can't discuss things with everybody, even though uh, technically you're not forbidden to. So first distrust. Double standards. Double standards is when there are holy cows in the company. The people who are always oh, such a high level professional. So he he said a bad word to you. Get over it. You're gonna reach their level then you're gonna talk no so when you have double standards when values work for some people and magically do not apply to some people and third uh your leader your supervisor does not support your development let me specify that as a leader i'm interested that my company I cannot single-handedly provide all the services at Telford. In fact, I single-handedly can provide a very, very small part of them. So it's in my egocentric interest to have very smart and good people so clients come back to us. And it's surprising how many times organizational leaders stifle the development of their people because they are afraid that people will leave, but they're not afraid that they're going to stay, you know. So three things, distrust, double standards, and the leader hinders your development. Mm -hmm. Thank you for these comments. Uh, we have another question in the chat. Uh, from Marina Dorosh. Imagine that the team has to work over time for some time, around a month, for example, because uh, uh, of the overlapping of projects. Normal story for culture and creative industries. We all uh, have uh, such experience, and nobody is happy about that, including the leader, of course. Uh, what are the best way, ways to motivate the team and to pretend, uh, to pretend that this is a great opportunity? Interestingly worded. Question. Well, um, I have a pretty dark sense of humor. So um, our team knows that as a leader, when my partner and I, when we decide to accept the killing project, there is a very good reason for it. There is either the industry is in shambles, as it was, for instance, when the war started in Ukraine. I mean, who needed? who needed PR in 2014, nobody. And there was no perspective as to when then the market would wake up. So when you accept a killer project, let your team know why. Because the unhappiness, the, the resentfulness from the inside oftentimes comes from the team thinking that you as a management did not plan well enough and you exercised poor judgment and now no one's sleeping when we accept the killer project i tell the people okay people this project pays your your and your salaries for six months uh, i know it's killer here's my part of the job and that's the other part tell your team why and then get down and work uh, if uh, my team uh, is monitoring uh, the internet for the client's crisis, they see that I'm working too. I'm active in Messenger. I answer emails. If they're not sleeping, neither am I. Mm, so we're not 
pretending, yes, but we consciously go into that hardship knowing why. Sometimes it's a screw up. And then we accept it's a screw up. We apologize and sign, make amends, make changes so that screw up doesn't happen. Uh, and we had a screw up because of COVID. One of our contractors, who was a big part of the research that we just uh, turned into the client, her team of five all fell ill. She was left alone with tons of data, 200 respondents only for us, and her other project. Naturally, she was late with everything. So on our part, our team got up at five o'clock in the morning and worked uh, because we understood that, you know, COVID. We weren't happy, but we knew why. Uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, and um, another question from my side. Uh, you were also, uh, also talking about the feedback and the importance of the feedback. And I, I suppose uh, this is uh, still a very um, uh, area for development, I would say, in many teams, in, in many organizations, uh, from a variety of reasons. Uh, what would, we, would be your recommendation or advice? How should we start building the feedback culture inside our teams, even if it's a, a small team of five people working on the project, mm -hmm. or vice versa, big organization of 50, 100 people, or, or even more? But if I want to start uh, building this uh, feedback culture, either as a manager or just as an employee, what should I do first? How should I treat myself? How can I start this? Okay, three steps. First, accept that feedback is work. From what we see in, not only in Ukraine, but with our global clients, is that the companies and organizations having problems with feedback have those problems. 80% of the reason is because leaders do not believe feedback to be work. They believe it to be talk on top of work the moment you understand as leaders that feedback is a way for me to discover problems when the problems are still small and inexpensive to solve then i value feedback step number two learn feedback is a skill uh, cultural aspects are very important uh, na national culture. There are cultures like um, Asia where direct feedback it's not accepted, it's not in societal norms. All right, there are other ways, but you have to be aware of them. So, know uh, how, learn, train, practice, because feedback and criticism aren't the same things and if you do feedback poorly that's how it's gonna look and third step uh institutionalize feedback put it in kpis put it in competencies put it in performance review make it an appraisable skill part of performance if all these three things are taken care of, there is, it's a very good start to develop feedback culture. And very practical uh, question based on uh, real life experience, let's say, that I, I'm sure us uh, faced. If you provide, for example, if I provide a feedback to someone and person consider this as a criticism, or um, doesn't want to continue the conversation, cannot, cannot accept this, or tries to explain why this or that uh, has been done. Uh, so the feedback is not accepted. Uh, what should I do uh, in this case? There are, there are several reasons that can lead to such a situation. The simplest mm -hmm. uh, and not the most frequent reason is the person can't accept feedback. There are people who make a conscious decision. 
that they are beyond reproach and they do not feel the need to change. That is not the most frequent situation, but it can happen. In such a case, this session should become the beginning of your separation <clears throat> with this person. More frequent reasons is either the person wasn't prepared uh, that feedback is at work, feedback is not to reprimand you, feedback is to understand what's going on and, and proceed productively. So the person wasn't uh, expecting it to be an instrument, but instead took it personally. Third reason, uh, the provider of feedback uh, didn't perform the act of feedback appropriately. There are at least five formats of feedback depending on how sensitive the situation is, how adequate feedback receiver is. And if you apply the same old sandwich format to everybody, that's going to be a problem. So prepare the person. The people should know that feedback is an execution. It's a work-related conversation. You prepare. I, we have to be skilled in doing that. To the point of saying, look, I'm not here to criticize you. I'm not interested in that. I want us to perform so that we can do this great event, this great festival, this great launch. But if we don't understand what happened, it can happen again and again and again. So help me understand what happened. I'm not asking who's guilty. I'm asking what broke and how we can fix it. And, and with time, with time, people will accept it. The length of time needed to accept depends on how toxic the culture was. If before people were shut down, disrespected, bullied, then this time to regain or, or build the trust will be longer. Um, uh, as we don't have other questions in the chat, uh, I uh, would like to continue with some questions from my side, if you don't mind. And uh, actually, I have a lot of them as usual, but uh, I will try to choose. Uh, uh, maybe a couple of last questions. Um, you also uh, were talking about the communication and the importance of communication as a uh, fuel or oil of the organization as a mechanism. Uh, but what does it does it mean in practice? Uh, like, what do we understand specifically? Say in communication inside the organization, what kind of behavior or practices or processes or instruments and tools this means? Mm -hmm. First of all, uh, every leader of every team has to have instilled schedule of their interaction with the team besides setting tasks. All those check-ins. So every leader has to have their own schedule of keeping their team abreast of what's happening and helping them mingle, socialize, and decompress. If you are a multi-layer organization, all of these leaders of the teams have somehow to come to the same vision of what's happening. So for every layer of your organization's management, there should be joint all them events, meetings, retreats, brainstorms, sessions, whatever, where they compare notes, talk differences out, solve problems, and every meeting like that has to have an owner, a moderator. So it's not a chit chat or bazaar vagzal, as we say. Uh, it's the organized discussion to which everyone prepared. Uh, and for every level, that must be. Third, if you, especially if you're a big organization, there must be some kind of bulletin, newsletter, chat, whatever source of information that everyone gets. What's the latest news? What's important? Reminders what to do. Uh, one of... Um, 
first one of our clients began to film one minute long videos for employees every week. You don't have to do it every week, but, but and everyone kind of watches and sees what's going on and can share and discuss. So three things in, in the teams communication, synchronizing what leaders are doing and then uh, opportunities for everyone to receive the information about the company and discuss it. There are different chats for that. So if this is happening, then your organization has a very high chance of being well glued together and not have some pieces that have developed a separate culture and kind of fallen off. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, probably the last question from my side uh, is about the uh, buzzword from one uh, on one hand, but that's uh, uh, a burning issue, uh, I would say, in the cultures here, especially after 2020 years crisis. It's about the burnout. Uh, as you heard during the previous uh, panel discussion, uh, everyone, I suppose, mentioned that uh, this year was very difficult for the teams, uh, cultural and creative industries, uh, institutions, organizations, and projects. Uh, and uh, to, to, let's let's face the truth: working in culture is uh, mostly uh, about uh, burnout because you are used to work uh, over times so because you are passionate about what you are doing. This is not so just your job; this is your life. And we all believe in in uh, in our in in what we are doing in our projects in our activities and organizations. So the burnout and 2020 uh, added to this burnout uh, even more and to our psychological condition and psychological health. What can we do as a teams and as leaders and as a teammates to support each other if we already have this burnout inside mm -hmm. the organization, or if, for example, I have this burnout? What is the strategy? Well, uh, the, the the burnout therapy begins with me as a team leader understanding what points of the project or process are temporarily left unattended because the person isn't isn't up up to par with themselves uh, because. You cannot help a person who has burned out if you don't give them a little breather. You can't have a person not sleeping until 3 a.m. and trying to help them with burnout. It's not possible. So uh, a good uh, thing to, to substitute or to get that person some help, hands-wise, uh, the kind of prophylactic prevention measure is what we have at our company. We uh, encouraged our people to give, uh, we have a level of skills that everyone possesses. You can't work at Telford and not be able to do one, two, three, four, five. And then on top of that, we have specialization. So if some uh, manager, has had a killer crisis and really needs to decompress alone. They uh, get together with other teams, discuss uh, what's happening. I explain what's happening. And then they give the parts of the project to people who are skilled to specialize in them. Uh, because we can't have people's um, physical uh, strain replace efficient processes it's not possible and uh, as as a leader it's our job to know when to tell someone passionate shut down your computer now and it's for their own good because someone who doesn't sleep and doesn't rest is a poor performer aside from the, the, the human part, they perform poorly and no organization needs that. So, uh, and talk, 30, per, 30 to 50% time spent on communication of a leader 
a lot of that goes to trying to understand what's going on, helping, especially online. I had once a two hour long chat with one of our managers at two o'clock at night because she was burned out and she was worried that she's not going to be able to take a new big project because she didn't yet understand the scale. When I described to her specifically what's going to be happening, uh, it took two hours for her to calm down. We corresponded during that time. But when she pictured that the work would be like this, not like this, she kind of calmed down. But it took two hours. Uh, if you have 10 team members, mm -hmm. they do 20 hours. Yeah, <laughs> um, and maybe uh, one last uh, comment from your side, maybe recommendation of some book, for example, to be worth reading uh, to our uh, conference participants about building this organizational culture, healthy environment inside the teams. What would you recommend to read for starters who just want to go uh, deeper in this subject for the first time? Mm, there's so many books, but... Um given that we are here in the multinational audience i would very much recommend two books they are on managing various diverse teams where not only organizational but but national cultures mix one of them is called uh, when cultures collide i will write it in chat if you like mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've heard uh, about this one. Yeah, and the other one is... And the other one is by Richard Lewis. It's also about uh, cultures. I will look up the exact name because depending on the edition, it's a bit different than if... Mm -hmm. May I will send it to you by messenger and you will share with everybody. These both authors are practitioners. These are very practical books, specifically management, communications, what to say, what not to say. So things are, and on the other hand, they are research based. So it's mm -hmm. not someone's anecdotal evidence that may not apply to you. Mm -hmm. that actually has solid scholarly background. It's mm -hmm. just written very practically. Mm -hmm. Marina, thank you so much uh, for such an insightful uh, presentation. Uh, it was very interesting and I hope it, will, it was useful for our attendees of the conference. And uh, we look forward to having you uh, at our closing event on July 8th uh, with uh, the second part uh, of our conversation uh, regarding the organizational resilience. So thank you so much for your time, for sharing your personal experience as well, and for an insightful presentation. Yeah, thank you for having me. And uh, from my thank all the attendees and participants who uh, spent time with us during the day or uh, during the different parts of our conference. I hope that you enjoyed this day and I hope that uh, you uh, will apply for uh, our upcoming opportunities, which will be available starting from tomorrow. Let me remind you that there will be open calls uh, for the civil society uh, sectoral event, for music event, for the visual arts event, and for performing arts event. All the information will be available on our website uh, of the Ukrainian Institute as well as on the website of the European Union delegation to Ukraine and the cultural relations platform. And uh, we also kindly ask you to uh, give us a feedback. Uh, we were talking about how feedback is important uh, and we really want to hear your feedback uh, towards us. So in the event chat, you can already see the link to the feedback form. I will also send it to all of you via email. So please fill in this short form. Uh, this will take only a couple of minutes from you, but it will be very uh, useful for us and important for us to prepare uh, as good uh, digital experience for you as possible uh, for our upcoming events. 
So thank you for uh, one more time, everyone, for being and staying with us. I hope you enjoyed. I, ha I hope that you uh, heard uh, something uh, important for you and uh, found some answers to some of your questions. And uh, stay in touch and uh, see you in July and hopefully even earlier. Uh, have a great day and have a great evening. Thank you.